students uh, today we'll be discussing the current affairs for 23rd of march 2022 the first topic that we'll discuss is the fuel price hikes in india recently as you know the petrol and the diesel prices have been hiked uh, and they have uh, reached to near rupees 100 petrol costs around rupees 100 while uh, you know diesel has been costing around rupees 90 in most of the metropolitan cities so we'll discuss the reasons behind this price hike and also uh, this issue was brought into the parliament and both the houses the lok sabha and the rajya sabha were adjourned as a result of the ruckus that was created around these issues second topic that we'll discuss this we'll detail in uh, discuss in detail sri lankan tamil families flee to india we know that there has been an economic crisis in sri lanka and uh, because of this economic crisis uh, there are a lot of people who are fleeing it okay we'll also discuss the shahid divas uh hypersonic missiles are something that we had discussed about 2 3 days back uh, with respect to the kinzhal uh missile which was fired by russia we'll just uh, revisit that particular issue and also uh we'll talk about retaining and releasing of lok sabha seats or the state assembly seats if a person is elected to both of them okay uh bs6 uh, vehicles and bs6 fuels we'll discuss of we'll also discuss the namami gange program under the ministry of jal shakti okay now the first topic fuel price hike sparks uproar in parliament over oh, here this particular infograph it has given a very nice understanding of where and all there will be a uh, fuel uh, where and all there will be a price hike when it comes to the price of fuels okay the uh, the fuel price depends upon the crude oil price because only after the uh, distillation of crude oil do you get different different fuels which are used okay only after this crude oil is refined do you get petrol you get diesel you get aviation turbine fuel okay and then you get several other polymers okay and then you get some uh, liquefied petroleum gas okay so you get all of these entities you also get naphtha as a result of refining of crude oil okay uh, so it is definitely dependent upon the prices of crude oil next it is also dependent upon the freight charges uh, what charges are applied on uh, bringing the crude oil from wherever we are importing to india and also the prices that are paid by the oil marketing companies to refineries to transport the refined uh, stuff from uh, the industry to uh, distributors okay now then the commission of the dealers is also added and then apart from that the central sec- central excise duty which is charged by the center is added to it and also the state value added tax which is charged by the states is added to it and the final uh, product is given to the customer and the customer has to bear all these charges which are which we had spoken of over here moving on okay india's oil marketing companies began recovering the higher crude oil costs that have prevailed in the recent months with an 80 paise increase in per liter in retail prices for petrol and diesel along with a rupees 50 increase in domestic cooking gas price all of them have increased petrol and diesel have increased by about 80 paise while the domestic cooking gas has increased by rupees 50 both the houses of the parliament were disrupted with opposition members demanding a roll back of the increases and walking out from the lok sabha rajya sabha proceedings were also marred by protests from members who also trooped into the well of the house demanding a discussion and hence this led to the adjournment of the house and finally the house was suspended for the day it has been reported that the indian oil corporation has notified its dealers of a second consecutive increase of 0.80 which is 80 paise in the prices of petrol and diesel that would take effect okay now a liter of petrol in delhi will cost about 97 rupees while diesel prices will be raised to 88 rupees economics ex- economists they expect that 
this uh, if at all the crude oil prices don't cool down okay currently the crude oil the brent crude oil it trades at around 120 dollars so economists estimate that if these prices do not reduce then uh, the price increase may last between 9 rupees and 12 rupees and it could go to even rupees 20 it seems okay now what is the effect of fuel hike on inflation you know that fuel is one of the major components of consumer price index and hence if fuel prices increase automatically the inflation increases and also fuel is one of the most basic components for any product say for example fuel prices increase then also you know the cost of logistics the cost of transport would increase and hence the final end product would also increase so it automatically feeds into the inflation okay such increases would undo the excise duty cuts affected by the government in november 2021 we had spoken about the excise duty which is levied by the center and we had spoken about the state vat which is laid by the states okay both of these are indirect taxes i'm sure you know what indirect taxes are while gst was being levied gst excluded petrol okay so any of these uh, components of crude oil were not included when gst was made uh, there are certain other components that gst excludes such as electricity related uh, charges or even alcohol so all these are not under the ambit of gst the price increases are expected to feed into retail inflation which has already exceeded the 6% mark it was 6.07% in february pinching households and denting consumption further petrol and diesel prices were last revised in november 2021 though crude oil prices surged by almost 30 dollars a barrel since then soaring even higher than 100 dollars a barrel following the invasion of ukraine by russia in the in november 2021 you know the excise duty was cut it was reduced and because the excise duty was reduced automatically the prices of petrol also cooled down domestic cooking gas prices have been unchanged since october 2021 earlier the price of bulk diesel was increased by rupees 25 a liter while the aviation turbine fuel prices had increased by 18% because of this automatically all your air tickets will become more expensive while lower excise duty relative to last year will help moderate the impact of international crude oil prices it will not be sufficient to lower fuel inflation of brent crude prices stay above 90 dollars so even if the center reduces the excise duty you know it might not be much of a help because crude crude oil prices are itself ranging somewhere at around 120 dollars a barrel so even if those uh, two rupees or one rupee of excise duty are reduced it's not going to matter much for the end retail customer now uh, you need to understand how fuel prices are computed in india okay in the year 2010 the prices of petrol were deregulated okay and in the year 2014 okay and in the year uh, 2014 the prices of diesel was also deregulated which means that it is not the government that fixes prices okay now since then prices are being revised on a daily basis okay uh, after after this happened since uh, this deregulation happened the prices of petrol and diesel are being revised every day every day in the morning these prices are revised and the new prices based on uh, what is the cost of the crude oil how much uh, charges that uh, you know how much commission dealers are getting all of that every day based on all of that every day the petrol and the diesel prices are changed okay uh, it happens on a daily basis the public sector oil marketing companies they make decisions on the pricing of petrol and diesel based on international product prices exchange rate tax structure inland freight and other elements okay so it is the oil marketing companies and they base it on several entities okay 
there are mo- mainly four factors that influence the rise in prices okay what are these four factors that lead to the rise of prices of uh, petrol the first factor will is crude oil like what we spoke if crude oil prices increase automatically the petrol prices would increase uh and if i mean crude oil it also includes the freight charges to transport the crude oil to india okay next excise duty of the center and also the third thing would be the vat which is levied by the states and the fourth and one of the most important things is the dealer commission at the gas station okay so these are the four things which impact the end cost of petrol or diesel that you are purchasing and uh, you know the oil marketing companies which uh, provide oil to the downstream sectors such as all these dealers and all they for them the charges uh, depend upon things like uh, international uh, international crude oil prices exchange rate tax structure inland freight charges all of that okay now moving on sri lankan tamil families flee to india the economic crisis in sri lanka has folk has forced at least 16 tamils to flee the country illegally and seek shelter in rameswaram in tamil nadu okay now what are the factors which are responsible for this current crisis in sri lanka underperforming tourism industry you know that for the last two and a half years we have the covid pandemic and in the middle of the covid pandemic all the flights and all were banned so tourist tourism sector actually took a big hit and especially for a country like sri lanka which relies heavily on tourism if the tourism sector is hit and if flights and travel is hit automatically the amount of forex that flows into the country will reduce the tourism industry which represents over 10% of the country's gross domestic product and brings in foreign exchange has been hit hard okay depreciating currency you know that whenever there is a dip or fall in the foreign exchange like say for example because of tourism the forex has been reducing or because of lack of sufficient exports the forex has been reducing and when when the forex reduces the amount of money that sri lankans have to shell out to purchase a uh, foreign exchange necessary to import goods will rise why because there will be more number of sri lankan rupees which will be chasing fewer number of dollars due to this, due to this the value of sri lankan rupee has further depreciated okay now when you know that the value of the sri lankan rupee has depreciated very sharply it will result in increasing inflation why because everything will start costing more and more money okay sri lanka depends heavily on imports to meet even basic food supplies such as sugar dairy products wheat medical supplies so when the price of the food items has ri- so the price of the food items has risen according to the depreciating sri lankan rupee so because the sri lankan rupee has depreciated it'll take more number of sri lankan rupees in order to import the same amount of items that they were importing earlier okay and there is also a diminishing inflow of foreign currency because of return of all these workers okay because of lack of exports because of lack of uh, tourism etc okay there is also an increasing food shortage in sri lanka okay this is because of the ban on the import of chemical fertilizers and to go only for an organic approach okay now because of all of this sri lanka had to impose an economic emergency recently and india has also been helping out sri lanka through several uh, credits like it had extended a 1 billion dollar line of credit earlier uh, about a couple of days back before that it had deferred a payment of 0.5 billion dollars okay it had provided a credit swap agreement for about 400 billion dollars and it had also provided a credit uh, for about another uh, half a billion dollars so india has been doing a lot of heavyweight pulling for sri lanka but 
what are the issues in india sri lanka relations you know that there is a problem of killing of fishermen under the unclos un Con- convention on the laws of the seas it is illegal for military people or uh, the naval people to kill uh, any unarmed fishermen however indian fishermen have been repeatedly killed by the sri lankan navy and this is a big issue okay east coast terminal project this particular project has very strategic location however india has been terminated from the east coast terminal project and uh, rather the west coast terminal project is now being developed by the adani group the okay, influence of china is increasing in sri lanka china's rapidly growing economic footprint in sri lanka is straining india sri lankan relations china is already the largest investor in sri lanka accounting for 23.6% of the total fdi during 2010 to 2019 china is also one of the largest export destinations for sri lankan goods and also holds over 10% of the external debt of sri lanka 13th amendment act this is also another bone of contention between india and sri lanka now why because this particular act it envisages devolution of necessary powers to provincial councils like the tamils you know that the tamils are located in the like say for example if this is sri lanka's map tamils are located in the northern most council and also a little in the eastern uh, province okay this northern province okay is completely covered by tamils now this 13th amendment it envisages adequate devolution of powers to the provincial councils however after this we had the 18th amendment act which rolled back some of the provisions of the 13th amendment act this was followed by the 19th amendment act which uh, re- actually reduced the powers of the president and it rolled back the changes which were caused by the 18th amendment act this has been followed by the 20th amendment act which again has increased the powers of the president reduced the powers of the parliament and the provincial councils okay now the provincial councils are again becoming helpless shahid divas okay please read these particular points also along with what we have written uh, below several people pay tributes to bhagat singh sukhdev rajguru on shahid divas more about the day every year on 23rd march shahid divas is observed it was on this day that bhagat singh sukhdev and rajguru were hanged by the british government they were hanged for assassinating john saunders please remember this they were not hanged for dropping a bomb in the central legislative assembly but rather for killing the police officer they had mistaken him for the british superintendent of police james scott it was scott who had ordered a lathi charge which eventually led to the death of lala rajput rai why was uh, why was lala rajput rai protesting he was protesting against the simon commission okay because there were no indian members in the simon commission which was to decide upon the constitution of india okay which was to de- decide upon if at all indians can go for self rule or not okay bhagat singh who had publicly announced avenging uh, lala lajpat rai's death went into hiding for many months and then he see- resurfaced along with mr badkeshwar dutt and they set off these two explosive devices inside the central legislative assembly uh, bhagat singh was bro- uh, you know born and brought up in jalandhar dob of punjab he belonged to a generation that was to intervene between the two decisive phases of the indian national movement the phase of extremism and the gandhian phase of the movement okay please know that bhagat singh's uncle was ajit singh who was also a very famous freedom fighter now um, in 1923 bhagat singh joined the national college lahore which was founded and managed by lala lajpat rai and bai parmanan okay bai parmanan was also another extremist and he had traveled to europe in order to muster enough support and later he went on to seattle and he set up uh, sufficient support groups in seattle as much as i remember yes in 1924 in kanpur he became a member of the hindustan republican association started by sachindranath sanyal the main organizer main organizer of the association was chandrashekhar azad 
and Bhagat Singh became very close to him. Okay. Only when he uh, was the member of the Hindustan Republican uh, Association, he became serious about the philosophy of the bomb. Philosophy of the bomb was written by Bhagwati Charan Vora. And Bhagat Singh was influenced by the philosophy of the bomb and he did not believe in peaceful means to uh, freedom. Uh, Bhagat Singh returned to Lahore and within the next year, he and his colleagues set up a militant youth organization called Naujawan Bharat Sabha. Now, this uh, Naujawan Bharat Sabha was actually introduced by Bhagat Singh itself, while the Hindustan Republican Association was started by uh, was started by Sachindranath Sanyal. Okay, in 1923. Now, uh, in 1926, okay, after you know, after the Naujawan Bharat Sabha was founded. He held that uh, this particular, you know, group would would encourage revolution against British rule. Okay, uh, and uh, Bhagat Singh he also served as the secretary of this Naujawan Bharat Sabha. Okay. In nineteen twenty six, Bhagat Singh established contact with Sohan Singh Josh. And through him, the Workers and Peasants Party, which brought out the monthly magazine Kirti. Okay, he later became a part of this editorial board of Kirti itself. And he was closely associated with the Workers and Peasants Party, remember. Okay, and in 1927, he was arrested on the charges of Kakori case conspiration, conspiracy. Now, what is the Kakori case? In the Kakori case, uh, they, Bhagat Singh and his comrades, they actually stopped a particular train and they looted the government money which was inside the train and also he was arrested for uh, an article which was written under the pseudonym Vidrohi. In 1928, Bhagat Singh changed the name of the Hindustan Republican Association to Hindustan Socialist Republican Association. He was very influenced by the socialist ideas and the Marxist ideas. His time in prison was spent protesting, seeking better living conditions for inmates. During this time, he also gained sympathy of the public, especially when he joined fellow defendant Jatindas. Later on, Jatindas died during the hunger strike. Okay. Uh, also, please remember that uh, Bhagat Singh was one of the editors, or he was on the editorial board of Kirti. Okay. Now, Bhagat Singh was initially you know, not inclined towards the violent mode of conflict for freedom. But when Gandhi withdrew the movement of non-cooperation in the wake of the Chauri Chaura incident, Bhagat Singh turned into revolutionary nationalism. Okay. He was massively affected by the Jallianwala Bagh incident. And he wanted to take revenge for this. Also, there were attacks on unarmed Akalis, Akali people. Akali people are those who are devoted to safeguarding the religion. Akali people in Nankana Sahib in 1921. So all of these incidents played a major role in influencing Bhagat Singh. Okay. No. It was Bhagat Singh and Bhatukeshwar Dutt who threw the bomb. But it was Bhagat Singh, Rajguru and Sukhdev who were hanged because they were involved in the killing of J.P. Saunders. Now, moving on. Understanding hypersonic weapons. Uh, please uh, go through the topic that we had discussed a couple of days back. We had discussed in detail about what is the Kinzel missile and what are hypersonic missiles and how they work. Now, over here I have written the difference between ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. Amongst hypersonic missiles also, you have either hypersonic glide missiles or hypersonic cruise missiles. Okay guide missiles. Missiles in general are classified into either ballistic or cruise missiles. Okay, while ballistic missiles, they follow a ballistic trajectory. Okay, uh, cruise missiles, they have a proper, uh, they remain in the atmosphere and flies the major portion of its flight at approximately constant speed. Over here, they don't have a ballistic approach, rather they have a straight approach. While in the case of uh, 
you know, ballistic missiles, it's more of a this parabolic approach. Target is predetermined in the case of ballistic missiles and it is a little difficult to change uh, the target that it is being hitting, uh, that it's going to hit. Targets can be mobile, more appropriate for small mobile targets. Okay, this uh, ballistic missile, it is relatively left unguarded and it is uh, governed by gravity majorly. While in the case of self, uh, while in the case of cruise missiles, they are self-navigating. Okay. Uh, while ballistic missiles are high altitude missiles, cruise missiles, they can fly very low altitude and thus it makes it difficult for the radar to sense it. Okay, recently Russia used the Kinzhal hypersonic missile in Ukraine. China in August 2021 had tested a nuclear capable hypersonic missile that circled the globe demonstrating an advanced space capability. And after China tested its hypersonic missile over here, uh, it was believed that China can even fire weapons from over the South Pole in order to hit the US. And this is a big problem for the US because most of its anti-missile defense systems are pointed towards the North Pole because they believe that most of the attacks will come from the North Pole. Russia was also able to launch a Sircon hypersonic cruise missile from a submarine which hit 350 kilometers away. Okay. The US also has active hypersonic development programs. However, it is behind China and Russia. What are hypersonic weapons? They are maneuverable weapons that can fly at speeds of at least Mach 5. They are maneuverable weapons in the sense that their, uh, that their flight path can be changed. Flight path can be changed. Okay. They travel at least five times the speed of sound. The speed of sound is Mach 1 and speeds above Mach 1 are supersonic and speeds above Mach 5 are hypersonic. Hypersonic weapons travel within the atmosphere and can maneuver midway which combined with their high speeds make their detection and interception extremely difficult. And this is the reason why radars can't uh, detect them or, you know, or ensure defense systems to negate these missiles. Okay. Uh, Hypersonic missiles are a new class of threat because they are capable of both maneuvering and flying faster than 5000 km per hour which would enable such missiles to penetrate most defense uh, defenses. Okay, UP opposition leader quits Lok Sabha to retain Karhal. This is nothing but a state legislative assembly seat. Okay. Now, after several days, Samajwadi party president decided to retain the Karhal seat and submitted his resignation from his parliamentary constituency to Lok Sabha speaker. Okay, resignation of the member of Lok Sabha. It is given under Article 101 of the Indian Constitution and it is also given in detail under the rules of procedure of the Lok Sabha. A member who desires to resign from one's seat shall intimate in writing uh, to the speaker. If a member hands over the letter of resignation to the speaker personally okay then uh, if the speaker is also uh, convinced that it is a very voluntary and genuine reason the speaker may accept the resignation immediately if the speaker receives the letter of resignation either by post or through someone else the speaker may make such inquiry as it is considered necessary to get satisfied that the resignation is voluntary and genuine okay if the speaker, after making a summary inquiry, either by oneself or through Lok Sabha, is satisfied that the resignation is not voluntary, then the speaker shall not accept the resignation. Okay. Also, please remember that a member may withdraw the letter of resignation any time before the speaker accepts it. Okay. Now, in case a person is elected to both the state legislative assembly as well as the Lok Sabha, what will happen? Article 101. Clause 2 of the Constitution along with Rule 2 uh, made by the President under the article says that members of the state legislature who have been elected to Lok Sabha must resign their seats within 14 days from the date of publication in the Gazette of India or in the official Gazette of the state, whichever is earlier. Failing this, their seats in the Lok Sabha shall be automatically cancelled and they shall fall vacant. Okay, please remember this that. Uh, those who are elected to the Lok Sabha must either leave their Lok Sabha 
both i mean those who are elected to both the lok sabha as well as the state legislative assembly either they should leave one of the seats so that the other can function properly okay now supreme court clarifies on bs6 vehicles registration now why is it in the news the supreme court permitted the registration of bs6 light and heavy diesel vehicles used for public utility and essential services now what is the benefit of this bs norms bs norms are based on european emission norms which are referred to in a uh, similar manner such as euro 4 and euro 6 implementation of the intermediate bs5 was cancelled and from bs4 india has shifted to bs6 okay uh now what are the features of this bs6 fuel the major differences between the existing bs4 and the bs6 norms is the presence of sulfur in the fuel okay while the bs4 contains 50 parts per million ppm sulfur the bs6 only contains 10 uh, parts per million of sulfur content also nitrogen oxides from diesel cars can be brought down by nearly 70% while in the case of petrol pa- petrol cars the nitrogen uh, oxide levels can be reduced only by 25% okay particulate matter like pm 2.5 and pm 10 are the most harmful components and the bs6 will bring out cancer the bs6 will bring the cancer causing particulate matter in diesel cars by 80% it will bring down please uh, it's a mistake on my part it will bring down the cancer causing particulate matter in diesel cars by 80% also as a part of the bs6 rollout car makers will have to put the following three equipments the first one is the diesel particulate uh, filter the second one is the selective catalytic reduction system the third one is the lean nitrogen oxide trap nitrogen oxides trap now uh like what we had discussed bs6 is nothing but a direct switch from bs4 to uh, bs6 please remember that the supreme court had taken up this uh, issue personally and held that after a particular cut off date i don't remember when it was it was in the year 2020 after this particular date no one or no company should be eligible to sell bs4 vehicles and only they should sell bs6 compliant vehicles okay moving on most of ganga is clean according to jal shakti ministry the water quality of the ganga was clean enough for bathing and capable of supporting the river ecosystem for almost the entire stretch of the river according to jal shakti ministry the dissolved oxygen what is dissolved oxygen the amount of oxygen which is present in the water per unit of water the dissolved oxygen which is an indicator of the river health was within acceptable limits according to the report of cpcb earlier the cpcb had released a report in the year 2018 which spoke about all the different parameters okay so a report by the cpcb pointed out four polluted stretches on the main uh, river ganga however okay these four polluted stretches uh, their rank you know their categorization is done on the basis of five categories which are ranked from 1 to 5 with one being the most polluted and five being the least polluted okay uh, the same cpcb report in the year 2021 noted that none of the stretches of the ganga were now in the priority category and only two two stretch they they are not in the priority category of 1 to 4 while there exist only two stretches which are in priority 5 category a comparison of the median data of water quality parameters such as dissolved oxygen biochemical oxygen demand then fecal coliform from 2014 and 21 has held that the dissolved oxygen has improved at 31 locations while the biological oxygen demand has uh, improved at 46 areas okay also the fecal coliform uh, levels have improved at 23 locations okay river cleaning is a continuous process and central government assists the state governments and urban local bodies through schemes like namami gange what is this namami gange 
and is an integrated conservation mission approved as a flagship program by the union government to accomplish the twin objective of effective abatement of pollution and conservation and rejuvenation of river ganga so it is there for both these objectives one is the reduction of pollution and the other one is the rejuvenation of river ganga it is being operated under the department of water resources under the ministry of jal shakti now the program is being implemented by the national mission for clean ganga okay please notice the difference over here it is being operated so most of the paperwork and most of the uh, planning and all of that happens under the ministry of jal shakti while the implementation okay what is actually done on the ground is done by the national mission for clean ganga now what is the national mission for clean ganga it is nothing but it is the implementation wing of the national ganga council okay so the national ganga council comes up with all the major policy decisions and this is headed by the prime minister who is the chairperson however most of the work on the ground the implementation part is done by the national mission for clean ganga now this entire namami gange project it has a 20000 crore corpus which is centrally funded and it is non lapsable okay which means that it won't get eroded after the end of the financial year rather the money that is there in the namami gange project keeps getting uh, extended now it is a central sector scheme the central sector scheme means that 100% of the funding is done by the center itself unlike in the case of a centrally sponsored scheme the main pillars of the program are sewage treatment infrastructure only the water that has been treated is uh, only the sewage water that has been treated is let out into the river ganga also river front development river surface cleaning at major cities and major uh, places there is a proper river front development there is uh, the creation of sufficient facilities uh, to enjoy the river uh, and to to provide amenities such as restrooms okay all of that that is known as river front development next biodiversity both inside the water as well as around the course of the river a forestation is being encouraged around the river there is also better public awareness regarding what people have to do and what they shouldn't do and how they should reduce the pollution which is uh, reaching the ganga also industrial effluent monitoring and ganga grams ganga grams are ideal villages uh which prevent the pollution of the river ganga 